appreciate our worship team so much and, and all of our volunteers, all of our small group shepherds, our sound people up there, camera people, one's helping with pro presenter, we need them all. So thank you all so much, I appreciate you. Well, as you know, tonight we're in Colossians chapter two, where Paul addresses four issues that Epiphras, um, the pastor of the church in Colossae, had been so concerned about. And some false doctrine was beginning to creep into the church uh, in Colossae. And the Colossian believers, most of whom were Gentiles, were being tempted to drift away from the purity of the simple truth of the gospel. Um, and this is something that we all need to be on our guard against. God created us humans with these wonderfully complex minds and you know the freedom to think for ourselves, make our own choices. But sometimes our thoughts can cause us to rebel against him. Pastor Wayne often says, Satan is a headhunter. You know, meaning that he shoots these fiery darts of unruly thoughts into our minds. And if we're not in the word, if we're not walking closely with Jesus, we can begin to get off. And so there, there were four areas where the Colossian believers were being tempted to get off. The first was called Gnosticism. Gnostic means knowledge. So the Gnostics believe that the material world is imperfect and it's evil and salvation can only come by escaping uh, from the material realm you know through the spiritual realm they thought that there was a spark of the divine within each individual but they just needed revelation to awaken in them the knowledge of their spiritual essence um, they thought that jesus was one of many saviors sent from the spiritual world to instruct people in the knowledge of god and in their own divine nature and you know thereby helping them achieve salvation it sounds a lot like some of the modern new age teaching going around doesn't it um, and it's also like intellectualism seeking truth and just acquiring more and more knowledge for knowledge sake so um, that was the first thing then the second temptation that some of the believers were struggling with was legalism um, some Jewish Christians called Judaizers were teaching that in order to be a true Christian, the Gentiles first had to become Jewish. Um, you know, the Jews were God's chosen people. So first the men had to be circumcised and then the people had to follow all the kosher eating rules and observe special feast days, etc. And then they could really be saved. So the Judaizers wanted the believers to add legalism to their faith. And then the third temptation was mysticism. Certain individuals in the church claimed to be super spiritual, you know, seeing and hearing things that others couldn't. They were communicating with angels, worshiping angels, things like that. And then there was asceticism. These folks were advocating that a person had to be extremely self-disciplined to be a Christian. They shouldn't eat meat, they shouldn't touch this or that. They said that disciplining your body was the key to having a real spiritual life. So Paul begins addressing these issues right off the bat in the beginning of um, chapter two, verse one. He writes, I want you to know how hard I'm contending for you, talking about in prayer. We talked about this last week. He was really praying for these people and for those in Laodicea, which was a neighboring town. And for all of you who have not met me personally, verse two says, my goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You remember from last week, Colossians 1.27, Paul also used that word mystery, you know, referring to something that wasn't known in the past but that now have been revealed, and it's this, that Christ in you is the hope of glory. And this is God's grand plan, you know, that he would send his son, he would die on the cross, uh, he would be resurrected, descend into heaven, and then the Holy Spirit would be poured out, and the Holy Spirit, God's own spirit would live in us, whether we're Jews or Gentiles. It's not that you're trying to live the Christian life, it's Christ is living in you and through you. And then he says in verse three, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 
he's omniscient. He's God. He knows everything. Absolutely everything. Verse 4 continues, I tell you this so that no one will deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I'm absent from you in body, I'm present with you in spirit, and I delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. I love that he starts out by giving these Colossian Christians some encouragement. You know, he calls out the good that he sees in them. When you're confronting or correcting somebody, it's always good to, you know, start out by mentioning what they're doing right and encouraging them. And then this opens their heart to receive what it is that you want to share. So Paul says he's just full of joy that these Colossian believers are disciplined and that their faith is still firm. And then verse 6 continues. So then, just as you've received Christ Jesus, the Lord, continue to live your lives in him. How do we receive Christ Jesus? Simply, like a little child, right? We humbly say, dear God, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Come into my heart. Make me your child. I believe in you. You know, please save me. Um, remember what Jesus said to the Pharisees and intellectuals in Matthew 18, verse 3. He said, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So Paul's saying here, just as you receive Christ, simply and humbly, continue to live your lives in him like that, simply and humbly. Um, verse 7, rooted and built up in him and strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. One of the main ways we're rooted and built up in him and strengthened in our faith is by being in the Bible, staying in the word of God, reading it, studying it, meditating on it, memorizing verses. Um, you know, the first century believers in Colossae only had the Old Testament. The New Testament was still being written like this letter here that Paul was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit while he was in jail. So we are very blessed to have the whole Bible. We have the New Testament as well as the Old to help us get to know God better and better and help us not be deceived by false teachers. So don't deviate what the, from what the Bible says and be thankful. And verse 7 says, think about all the Lord has done for you and overflow with thanksgiving. Now here comes his warning about the Gnostics. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. So what the false teachers called, you know, enlightened and liberating Paul calls the elemental spiritual forces of the world. In other words, evil spirits, you know, who use philosophy to twist the truth and confuse people. And he's saying, watch out for that vain philosophy and all that intellectualism, um, which are according to the teaching of men and evil spirits and not Christ. For in Christ, verse 9, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Back up in verse 3, he had said, in him, in Jesus, are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And here he says, in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. In other words, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, and he's omniscient. He knows absolutely everything. There's nothing he doesn't know or understand. So stay close to him. Stay in his word, rooted and grounded in Christ, and be thankful. You know, the Gnostics... We're coming into the church probably saying things like this. You have to seek knowledge and revelation. You know, let me tell you what Aristotle and Plato and Socrates said about the divine spark within. Paul says, beware of those guys who say that you have to be philosophers or intellectuals to be Christians. No. The gospel is so simple, even a little child can understand it. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, apart from Jesus Christ, warned his son in Ecclesiastes 12, 12, of making many books, there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. You know, in Solomon's day, information was mostly limited to books. In our day, information takes lots of other forms. Um, you know, if Solomon could say this, when there wasn't a printing press, there was no internet or television or radio, and just only a fraction of the books that we have now, what would he say if you lived in our day? I mean, the amount of information at our fingertips is overwhelming. 
And a lot of it is untrustworthy. You know, there's so much fake news out there, right? So much false information. So Paul says, stay close to Jesus. Plant yourself in his word, not in human philosophies or new age ideas or intellectualism. In Christ, we have everything. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in him because he's God. You know, human knowledge keeps changing. As scientists discover new things, old ideas are thrown out. Years ago, when we lived in California, our pastor was a brilliant man who had previously been a science professor, uh, you know, before the Lord called him to, into ministry. He was a PhD who conferred doctorates on others, and he'd even written a college science textbook. But I remember him saying in one of his sermons how the textbook he'd written was already out of date and no longer in use because scientific knowledge had just changed so much. It's constantly changing, and it'll keep on changing. So there's a warning for us here, too. Be careful of intellectuals or philosophers or scientists who sound so smart but seek to pull you away from the simplicity of the gospel. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So stay close to Jesus. Keep strengthening your relationship with him. And stay in his word. Only he is immutable and unchangeable. Like the old hymn says, on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. You know, my husband and I had a brilliant friend named Randy back in the 1970s in our church youth group. And he was on fire for the Lord and he wanted to go into full-time ministry. But because he was so brilliant, he applied to Oxford. Um, I forget which of the Oxford colleges, but, and he got in. So he and his bride moved to England and he began to study theology and philosophy at Oxford. But three or four years later, his bride, Linda, moved back to San Jose on her own. Come to find out Randy had taken all of these courses from all these brilliant professors and other super intellectual students like himself, you know, but in the process, he drifted away from Jesus and the teachings of the Bible. Um, you know, he went to, to Oxford to study theology and prepare for ministry, and he ended up being an atheist. So in the end, Randy and Linda's, you know, views and lifestyles became so different that they divorced. And their story isn't unique. A lot of Christian kids who grow up in church end up going off to university and getting confused by all the intellectual ideas that they're exposed to and they drift away from the Lord. So Paul says here, beware of that. Hold on to Jesus and the simplicity of the gospel. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And now beginning in verse 10, he's gonna warn them about not getting caught up in Jewish legalism. He writes, in Christ you have been brought to fullness. Some translations say you are complete in Christ. He is the head over every power and authority. In him, you are also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Uh, as I said, many of the Colossians Christians were Gentiles. Um, the men had not been circumcised but like Jewish men had. So verse 11 is really important. He says, in Christ, you were already circumcised, but with a circumcision not performed by human hands. He's talking about spiritual circumcision, not the cutting of the flesh. Verse 11 continues, your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised spiritually by Christ. Uh, this is much more significant than snipping off a little bit of skin. He says, your whole old self ruled by the flesh was cut off by Jesus when you came to him. Verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. That's what water baptism speaks of, right? When we go down under the water, we're dying to our old life and then our, you know, our flesh. And then when we come up out of the water, that symbolized that we're being resurrected to a new life in Christ Jesus. Verse 13, when you are dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive in Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, referring to demons, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You are dead in your sins, Paul said. 
and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, but God saved you. He made you alive in Christ. And now you've been spiritually circumcised. So your whole old self ruled by the flesh was cut off and cast away when you received Jesus as your savior and your Lord. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or <clears throat> with regards to a religious festival or a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. So he's referring you know, to the kosher food rules uh, that the Jews followed and the feasts and the festivals of Judaism. These are a shadow of the things which were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So all those Old Testament rules and regulations that Moses gave to the children of Israel, those were just a vague outline. They were just a shadow uh, pointing to the one who was to come, Jesus Christ. And this is a silly illustration, but <clears throat> you wives wouldn't try to hug your husband's shadow, you know, when he came home from work, right? Um, you would hug him. And Paul's saying that those, those rules and regulations, that was just uh, in Old Testament times to help them understand something about Christ. But now that Jesus Christ has come and you are in Christ, you don't have to embrace the shadow anymore. You have Jesus Christ himself. The Judaizers were coming into the congregation in Colossae and they were saying, well, if you want to be a real Christian, you have to be a Jew too. I've already kind of mentioned this, but you know, Gentile men need to be circumcised. You have to follow these rules. Paul says, no, that's wrong. Don't let anyone get you into bondage to legalism. Legalism, rule keeping, causes people to feel self-righteous like the Pharisees. But the problem with that is you can't keep all the rules indefinitely. So then you feel guilty and unworthy and condemned because you, know, you became a hypocrite trying to keep up this outward image of holiness when in reality you knew you couldn't keep all those rules. Here's the great news in verses 13 and 14. God forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He's taken it all away, nailing it to the cross. So not only were your sins nailed to the cross, but all those religious rules and ordinances and regulations which condemned us have been nailed to the cross too. Paul wrote in Galatians 5, uh, one through two. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. So don't let the Judaizers try to make you slaves to religious rule keeping. Don't fall for it, he says. Legalism was first seen way back in the Garden of Eden. The serpent said to Eve, Eve, has God really said to you that you can't eat from any tree in the garden? And Eve said, no, we can eat from any tree, except God said, don't eat from the tree of knowledge and good and evil, and don't even touch it. Well, God hadn't actually said, don't touch it. Probably Adam told her that. Probably Adam said, honey, just stay away from that one tree. God said, don't eat from it, so let's not even touch it. And you know he was trying to protect Eve, and a lot of times that's how legalism starts. Um, you know we make up these rules to protect people so they stay away from sin, but then those rules can become bondage. I know this from experience because the churches that I grew up in were pretty legalistic. We didn't dance or drink or go to movies. Some of the ladies didn't believe in wearing makeup or earrings or pants. Some didn't even believe in ever cutting their hair. And I remember some of my friends who were Catholics had rules about not eating meat on Fridays. You know, only fish was allowed. But Paul says, beware of all kinds of religious legalism. Following man-made rules might make you feel holier than others, but they have nothing to do with true spirituality. And next in verse 18, he's going to warn them about mysticism, the third thing that was creeping into the church in Colossae. He says, do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. So don't let anyone trick you, in other words. Such a person goes into great detail about what they've seen and they're puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost their connection with the head. In other words, with Jesus Christ, 
from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. So some people in the church in Colossae were claiming to have seen and heard things that nobody else saw, nobody else heard. They were you know, saying they had seen angels and you know, saying we should worship angels, etc. And because of these mystical experiences that they'd had, they were all puffed up with pride. But Paul said, don't be fooled and don't let them disqualify you from your faith. Hold on to Jesus Christ, focus on him, not on angels or whatever else these super spiritual mystics say that they have seen and heard. Jesus is the head of the church and we're his body and we're entirely dependent on him. And now Paul's gonna address the fourth thing that was tempting the believers to get off and that was asceticism, which is like I said, extreme self-denial. These super disciplined ascetics were trying to bring glory to God by denying themselves food and comfort and pleasure. And this is how they were hoping to impress God and impress people and earn their way into heaven. But as Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, it is by grace you're saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's a gift from God. It's not of works so no one can boast. To give you an example of asceticism, back in the fourth century, there was a Christian Syrian ascetic named Simeon, who came to be known as Simeon Stylitis. And he got famous for living for 37 years on a small platform on the top of a 90-foot pillar near Aleppo in modern-day Syria. Several other style, style lights, you know, which literally means pillar saints, you know, followed Simeon's example, preaching and fasting and praying from the top of a pillar. And to this day, Simeon is venerate, venerated by the uh, Oriental Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox, and the Roman Catholic churches. Obviously, he endured heat and cold and rain and sleet and snow up there, and he didn't have fellowship with any friends, and all his food and drink had to somehow you know, be raised up to him. I mean, what a crazy life. But through this extreme self-discipline and deprivation, he was trying to earn his own salvation. Um, a more well-known Christian ascetic was Martin Luther before he became a famous Protestant reformer. He wrote this about his life as a monk. He said, when I was a monk, I wearied myself greatly for almost 15 years with daily sacrifice tortured myself with fastings and vigils and prayers and other rigorous works. I earnestly sought to acquire righteousness by my own works. And then in 1510, Martin Luther was sent to Rome where he even climbed, uh, climbed the Scala Santa, the so-called Holy Stairs, on his knees, repeating the Lord's Prayer and kissing each step as he went. But in the midst of his spiritual struggles in his self-denial, Luther had become obsessed with this one verse he read, Romans 1, 17, which says, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it's written, the righteous will live by faith. And that verse convicted Martin Luther of his asceticism, and it opened his eyes to the religious abuses um, that he had, had observed in the Catholic Church, such as selling papal indulgences where people believed they could have their sins forgiven by giving money to the church. So in 1517, he posted his famous 95 theses on the door of the church in Wittenberg, Germany, and he ended up being excommunicated by the Catholic Church, and then he became perhaps the most famous Protestant reformer but it all stemmed from his having his eyes open by scripture to the fact that salvation um, and righteousness in God's eyes do not come from any human works. They don't come from self-denial. Um, salvation is by grace alone. It's all through faith, period. And so here's what Paul has to say about asceticism in verse 20. He says, since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of the world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. 
Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Asceticism doesn't eliminate a person's sin nature or the cravings of their flesh. It just makes them feel proud or depressed or defeated. So to summarize chapter two in closing, don't get sucked into erudite intellectualism. Don't get caught up in religious legalism. Stay away from mysticism and asceticism because they have no spiritual value at all. As Paul said in verse six, even as you have received Christ Jesus as your Lord, so walk in him. The way you enter the kingdom of God is humbly like a little child. So stay that way. Keep focusing on Jesus. He's our savior. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. So intellectualism, new age philosophy, legalism, mysticism, asceticism, those things just mess us up and get our focus off of Jesus. So don't be deceived. Hold fast to Jesus. Let's close in prayer. Thank you so much for your word, Lord, which teaches us that you alone are the way, the truth, and the life. It's only by grace through putting our faith in you that we're saved. Thank you for warning us about all these theological errors, which are still getting some Christians messed up today. Help us to stay in your word and stay close to you because you alone can save us. And we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great week.